relationship styles and intimacy styles and how they differ. So I figured I could set off a whole bunch of definitions at you guys. And you can sit there with your notes and, and do whatever. But I feel that's not the most productive thing. What I want to talk about is how to communicate and how to understand what the difference is between your relationship style and your intimacy style. Now, when I say intimacy style, what does that mean? That means to me, it's how you express affection or intimacy towards another person. This isn't something that's static. It's not necessarily an orientation, and it can change over time, depending on the people you're with. You express intimacy differently with family, with friends, with significant others or partners, whatever you want to call them. Um, but intimacy is something that everybody does express differently. So for example, the hottest topic, I'm sure, is in a relationship. Many sexuals will express intimacy through sexual contact, or eventually uh, through sexual contact, not necessarily right away, but a lot of sexuals in a relationship will have that expectation that it's going to escalate to that point at some point. Maybe after marriage, maybe after a set number of dates, you know, the three dates, the five dates, the, the three months, whatever it is. But the way I like to explain it when I'm coming out as asexual and people ask me what that means, is I say that my way of expressing intimacy is just different. Um, I often draw an analogy to angry people. Some people, when they get angry, they will scream, they will shout, they will throw things. Other people, when they get angry, they go completely quiet. Some people, when they fall in love, want to hug, want to cuddle, want to hold hands. Other people, when they fall in love, want to jump into bed together. Other people want to tie people up, or be tied up, or any other thing under this umbrella. I and mean, each person, and each interpersonal connection has that unique way of expressing that emotion, that affection, and that intimacy. And that'll change again over time, depending on the person you're talking to, depending on the mood you're in. <laughs> so when we talk about intimacy styles, often there's a, a broad themes to each individual person's intimacy. Uh, one person in, a rela or in relationships will tend towards being very touchy-feely. We might call this sensual. So they might want to hold hands, hug, cuddle, maybe even kiss in a non-sexual manner. Other people in relationships much prefer the more sexual relationships, so they'll create sexual tension and they'll eventually have sex. Other people in relationships, in close relationships, will have um, a, what we might call aromantic ways of expressing affection. So be that com commitment, moving in with a partner, or generally doing things that are nice for them without necessarily that romantic overtone. So that's one entire dimension of relationships that often does not get talked about at all, is how you express affection and how you receive affection. So I think that's equally important as well to know about yourself, about what makes you feel good, what makes you feel loved. I know this is probably a shared experience among a lot of people here, especially, where I've had a relationship in the past, where we talked past each other. We talked completely different languages when it came to body language. We spoke English. We could talk to each other. But we really couldn't communicate through body language because my method of expressing affection and intimacy was things like a scratch on the shoulder, or a hug, or a cuddle. Whereas his method of expressing intimacy was sexual. Um, when he wanted to tell me that he loved me, he would want to have sex to make me feel good. If I wanted to tell him I loved him, I wanted to give him a hug to make him feel good. That's all fine and dandy. I know that I like giving hugs. But to him, it felt there was a lack. To him, it wasn't the right way for him to receive that affection either. So I see a lot of nods. This is something that I do. <laughs> awesome. So I wanted to highlight that aspect of relationships, where there's an intimacy style. You've got how you give intimacy and how you perceive and receive intimacy are two very important things to think about and to talk about in a relationship. If your partner is of the variety where holding hands is their way of expressing intimacy, and they hold your hand, but that's not how you feel intimacy, then you may be left out in the dark. You may end up feeling unattractive, not loved, not important. When
when the exact opposite could be true. So that's one aspect of relationships. The other one I wanted to talk about was relationship styles as separate from intimate styles. So any style of intimacy can be mixed with any type of relationship you like. Pick and choose your favorites, and then find someone that likes it. <laughs> um, relationship styles, I like to think of everything on a spectrum. So you've got everything from monogamy to polyamory. You've got open relationships to closed relationships. You've got hierarchical relationships to egalitarian relationships. I'll take a moment to explain those terms. So we'll start off with egalitarian to hierarchical. They follow the very base definition of the, root of the word very well, where a hierarchical relationship will be, for example, my significant other is the most important person in my life. If they call me and I'm in the middle of a lunch with my friend and they need something, I will pick up. They have a hierarchically higher position than friendship, for example. Or in a polyamorous community, you might have a primary partner. That is, you have more commitment, more involvement, and that can be defined however you like it to be. Commitment can be defined in any way you feel inclined. Um, and then you might have a secondary partner where there's still commitment. But there's the understanding between both of you that your primary partner comes first. On that from one end of the spectrum, you can shift all the way over to the other end, which is egalitarian. Um, on this end, you tend to get the uh, relationship of anarchists, for example, that's kind of the extreme, where relationship anarchists say, everybody is important to me equally. You're all awesome. And I will pay attention to whoever I think needs it most at this moment, regardless of whether you are my primary, my secondary, my significant other, friend, label doesn't matter. So anywhere on that spectrum, some people feel more secure in a hierarchical uh, relationship because they feel that they know where they are, they know what level of commitment they can give and receive. Others feel more secure in the egalitarian relationship because it leaves it more fluid and free as time goes on to redefine or to treat people as you see and feel is best in that instant without placing labels or needing a hierarchy in there. I like to think that as one dimension. Another dimension is our open versus closed relationships. And this could be in any possible way. So a closed relationship typically means you're not allowing other people in. So if it's a closed sexual relationship, for example, then you would only have sex with that one partner that it's closed with, or more, one or more. So there is such thing as closed polyamory as well, where you have a triad, for example, three people who will only have sex with each other if it's sexually closed. On the other end of it, you've got an open relationship where you'll share some things in a context of a relationship and other things you're allowed to take outside of the relationship. Uh, what's very common in open relationships is to have it closed in one aspect and open in another. So unless the relationship anarchy is the only one I've ever seen truly, truly open in all ways, uh, most other relationships will say, you know, I want to be emotionally monogamous or emotionally closed. But hey, if you have sex with other people, I don't care. Um, so there's that spectrum as well. You've got kind of two axes going on. The third one I want to talk about is polyamory versus monogamy. I think most people will know the definitions, but monogamy, or at least ideal monogamy, is uh, the sense that you have one partner, one significant other in your life, and that's the most or that's the only relationship you have at a time. Um, it can go from what is sometimes called serial monogamy, where you have one relationship, one relationship at a time, but once you break up with someone, you might date another. It can also be strict monogamy, where you have one partner in your life ever. That's, that's something that some people do and are very happy with as well. You go right up to polyamory, where you can have, in theory, as many partners as you like. In practicality, you're limited by time, effort, things like that. Um, if you all want to date me, it would be great, but I don't have time to take you all on a date before dinner. <laughs> so I think that's just about what I wanted to say. I'm not going to go over every type of relationship, except to stress that your intimacy style and your relationship style can mix and match in just about any possible way. So any of these relationships that we talk about, you can do sexually, or romantically, or romantically and sexually, or none of the above, anything. And in any kind of intimacy style, we can also match it up with any relationship style. And I'm gonna hand it over to Sophie in case she wants to say anything.
chunk, so let's bring this down to the earth. I've seen people with life partners that they've never physically touched ever in their entire life, and they never will. But what they do is they live together as roommates, they support each other financially, emotionally, and in many other ways, and they're just, they are life partners. So they, where one will find a new job, part of the consideration will be if I move, can my partner find a job in this new town as well? So there's that level, I think the, the primary difference, at least to me, between a friendship and a queer platonic relationship is that level of commitment and caring. Whether it manifests romantically or sexually or neither, that commitment and caring and kind of relationship the aspect is still there. And that's, again, another intimacy style that you get to negotiate yourself. The great thing about being such a small community is we can invent all the rules as we go. <laughs> together the 
other. They keep all their finances separate. They're in a romantic relationship, but they've never filed, and they could, according to the government, they're okay. So it sounds like, like if you file a joint tax return, you're declaring yourselves in well, debt at least. I think it's a box that you can stick. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I, yeah. I think the answer to both your questions there is that only is it an issue if one of the parties bring it up and they hadn't filed for common law, then the government intervenes and kind of typically rules that they are common law is that after a certain amount of time, and then assets get divided. So if you apply for common law, you're automatically common law for six months. If you don't apply and there's no issues and you just break up and you, like, you can sort things out, then sort things out. But if um, you can't sort things out and it's past a certain length, then the law gets involved and gets ugly. Because I have friends on like probably all four sides of that that have seen all the results of. <laughs> uh, there was one person here. Uh, I just wanted to bring up since so few people aren't so super familiar with Canadian lines like in the country. Um, uh, filing joint taxes in the U.S. You file them as a couple. I understand, um, but in Canada, you file as a couple, but it's not really the same way. It's it's very different from in the U.S. Whereas in the U.S. you always file as a couple, but in Canada you file individual tax returns where you say I'm married to this person, and the government considers that. But in the U.S., like their income is very much together. Um, also, uh, Italy sounds like they might not have no fault in divorce, um, but uh, in Canada you can just say one in divorce, and you could be like, is there a reason? It's like, no, we just decided to get a divorce, and you can just legally do that. They, they, they go out. You do have to wait a year. Oh, you have to wait a year? But, yeah, you have to be separated for a year. Um, but I think the other one that came up was annulment, and I think that might even be like an old Catholic church terms that you prove that uh, yeah. my marriage was never consummated. So within the Catholic Church, you can say, I am not divorced. I'm not in this marriage. Therefore, I was never married. Therefore, I'm eligible to marry again. Well, I guess I can't have you there, right? 